Hi, and welcome to Wealthy On. I'm James Conner, and today my guest is Nick Colas. Nick is the co-founder of Data Trek Research, which provides data-driven analysis on the markets. And we're going to get Nick's views on the economy and the markets and what he learned from working with the infamous Steve Cohen. Nick, thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in New York? Uh, things are good. We just had a huge rainstorm come through, but things are clearing up, and hopefully the sun comes out later today. Well, that's good. I guess rain is better than snow. It is, absolutely. Nick, before we get your views on the economy and the markets, I want to ask you about the time you spent with Steve Cohen. He's had a very successful trading career. That might be an understatement, but nonetheless, I'm gl- I bet you learned a lot from him. Maybe you can just share your experiences. Sure. I mean, I went into that, uh, into that company with no prior trading experience, and they've been successful for a bunch of years, very well known on the street. And I thought it'd be a great opportunity to learn a lot from what you said, you know, correctly is you know, fantastic, probably one of the best traders of the last hundred years here in the States. And I learned two things. The first, I actually learned from the in-house psychologist, a guy named Ari Kiev, who wrote several books based on his experience at SAC, most of them called Trading to Win. And we had to spend time with, with Ari every single week in the first year of working at SAC, every new trader did. And what he would always try to get us to focus on is to go through every trade, understand our rationale, but then he would ask us questions like, how did you feel going into this trade? What were your emotions? Were you confident? Were you nervous? Were you comfortable? Were you relaxed? Were you in the groove? And Ari had spent a lot of time at training Olympic athletes before coming to work for Steve. And that was the same approach he used with them. That's what Steve liked so much about it, because trading is a lot like those other uh, athletic endeavors. You have to feel comfortable. You have to feel ready. You have to feel prepared. And Ari got us to understand that our intuitions, how your body feels, is actually a really important part of being a successful trader. So if you are done the work and have put together your trade and you feel good about it and it starts to work, you should use that as reinforcement to add to the position. If it's not working and you felt confident, you still feel okay in cutting that back and, and, and cutting your losses. And so feeling that level of confidence, feeling that intuition that you're on the right track was a really important part of the feedback loop that Ari tried to teach all of us. It's not just your brain, but it's literally your body telling you what's a good trade, what's a bad trade, and how to go through a position and make money on it. Or as with most traders know, not lose very much because your winners really don't out never your loser by all that much, maybe 55, 45, but it's pressing that 55 that's working that actually makes you all the money as a trader. The second thing I learned was directly from Steve, and he would tell us this all the time, particularly if a trader was having a bad day or a bad week, he'd walk over midday, early afternoon, sit down with that trader and say, look, you're making this a lot harder than it has to be. Don't do that. Go back to basics. Go back to your process. Focus on what you know and stop overthinking, over thinking, making things way too complex. Trading is ultimately a pretty simple game, right? You know, you're there to make money, but a lot of people get caught up in emotions or in politics sometimes, or what they think they know, or that the market's wrong. And all those things really just make it more complex than it has to be. So the central thing I learned from Steve was just don't make this game harder than it has to be. Focus on the fundamentals, focus on the basics and stick to that. And chances are with enough hard work, you'll be successful. So it was a tremendous experience working for Steve, saw a lot, learned a lot. And those are the two things I really took away that really still affect me to this day and, and inform what I do at Data Trek. Oh, fascinating comments. I, I'm curious, is Ari still working with Steve? You know, Ari passed away a, a couple of years ago, uh, very sadly, but, you know, his books live on. They're available on eBay. They, they go for a lot of money because they're really gold. Ari literally chronicled the first couple of years of working for Steve and uh, put together profiles of different traders, all of whom who I knew in the room at the time, and explains, you know, what their different foibles were, what they did right, what they did wrong, and how they got through what ultimately is a mental process and a mental discipline to become better traders over time. Yes, it's so true, isn't it? Like how many times have we, everybody's made this mistake, but we've put a trade on because we think we're right, the market's wrong, or we put on a trade and it becomes a losing trade and a $10,000 loss can quickly turn into a $100,000 loss and that can even grow bigger. And uh, once again, it's all based on this, I guess, ego. It is. And that's, you know, it's funny because traders are known for having big egos, but when you watch them trade, they don't, you know, the great traders say, okay, I got that one wrong. 
no problem. Cut it down. Get it off the sheet. Let's focus on things that are going right. Because as I said, the win rate of a great trader is 55, maybe 60% in an awesome month. And you make all your money really on a handful of positions in any given day, week, month, year. You know, That's what I always found. That's what the room usually showed me was that the game is to stay in the game and let those winning positions run, make that money, and don't let the other stuff get too much in the way. Yeah, yeah. I guess a lot of it really comes down to discipline, right? It's no different than any other endeavor, including sports, right? Exactly. And that's how Ari treated, treated it. That's how Steve treated it. It's really just a matter of staying in the game every day, focusing on a little bit of improvement every day. You know, skills are like the stock market. You want to be in long enough to compound. You know, if you get 1% better every day, you're going to double how good you are in just a couple of months. But you have to focus on getting 1% better every single day. Well, interesting comments. Thank you for sharing that uh, co those comments with us. So I'll, I want to move on now and get your thoughts on the economy and and also the markets. And, and before we really do that, I want to provide a framework for our viewers. And, and I want to have a discussion on economic cycles and how these in cycles drive the markets. Can you, maybe you can just take us through the cycles and what cycle you think we're in right now. Sure. So just, you know, at a very basic level to start the conversation, the average economic cycle in the U.S. lasts roughly 60 to 65 months. That's the average back literally through the 1800s. Some cycles are shorter, some cycles are longer, but that's the average. And a cycle is defined as basically recession to recession. So when the last recession ended to when the next recession begins, everything else in between is, you know, what I call a mid-cycle economy, a mid-cycle market. Late cycle is when you know you're going into a recession, you know oil prices have spiked or a financial crisis has hit, and you know companies are going to be laying off people, the economy is going to contract, that's late cycle. Early cycle is when the economy is in a recession. <clears throat> we know that job losses are pretty steep. We know economic growth has gone negative, and that's the, the early part of a cycle. You know, typically speaking, the best returns are not in the early part of a cycle in U.S. stocks, which people often misunderstand. The best returns are in the middle of the cycle when the economy is chugging along well, when companies are growing. And ideally, when we have a new technology like we have with Gen AI now, it's going to get people excited about, about owning stocks. So there's early and mid and late cycle. I think we're in the mid part of a cycle. Okay, so I want to get your thoughts now on interest rates and inflation, because this takes up the narrative every day when we listen to CNBC or any other YouTube channel. Everybody's talking about interest rates and inflation. And in July of 2021, Powell suggested that inflation was transitory. That seems like a century ago, but that was just in July of 21. Yeah. And then by January of 22, he still said inflation would continue to decline. But then by March of 22, he realized, OK, inflation's out of control. We got to do something. And the Fed lifted interest rates 11 times since then. And as we went into 2024, everybody was expecting aggressive cuts. And I think we were looking for six cuts. And then as we got into 2024, we said, oh, it's only going to be three cuts. And here we are now, we just entered Q2. And I want to get your views on, on where you think interest rates are going and what the Fed's going to do and if and will they cut this year. Yeah, you're right. We, we came into the year thinking we're going to get a lot of cuts. Two years reflected that. Fed fund futures reflected that. And thankfully, the equity market didn't really believe it because rates have gone up. Uh, and the expectation now is we might get three. I think Fed Funds futures are still the modal expectations, roughly at three, you know, 35 percent odds, give or take. But there's a pretty even distribution that says two might be the answer and now much less of a guess that four might be the answer. I think we've taken four safely off the table. The issue we face right now is, is pretty straightforward and it's a mixed thing for equities, because on the one hand, the economy seems to be doing still pretty well. It's not great, but we're getting 2% growth, more or less. We're getting reasonable job numbers, even after revisions come through. We're getting pretty sticky wage growth, which means that consumers are getting paid a little bit more than inflation, but it's not coming down very quickly. There's still a labor shortage in this country in a lot of different sectors, and that's driving wages to be much stickier than they otherwise would be. You know, the reason inflation declines after a recession is because wage growth slows down to basically zero. We haven't had a recession, anything but really. So we've had wage growth continue to be pretty high. And so inflation has stayed high. And this is the central problem for the Fed. Powell talks about it, talked about it last Friday, talked about it yesterday. We're not seeing that kind of slowdown in wage inflation that will allow overall price inflation to keep coming down. And so inflation is proving very sticky. My perspective is I think we get two rate cuts this year, not three. 
the Fed is usually wrong. Like we just saw the Fed's latest projections last month for rate cuts over this year. They still said three. But on average, most of those March projections they gave are wrong by at least one cut or one increase. And so I'm thinking they're wrong by one. And we get two probably in July and then not until December. The Fed does have to deliver on its promise or risk losing credibility yet again. And you pointed out that they've rightly lost credibility before and in the recent past. They really can't afford to make that mistake again. They can afford one or two rate cuts, but they have to go slow. So I see the pace of rate cuts as very slow this year. And I don't think twos, you know, two year yields come down very quickly and tens might actually go up over the near term. So pretty tough situation for bond traders. Um, but I think still okay for stocks because we do have the backstop of decent wage growth, a decent economic picture, and enough to create some corporate earnings growth. So let's talk about inflation a little bit more. And, and this whole move in, in interest rates has to do with this move that we saw in inflation. It went up to as high as 9%. Now the government's saying it's somewhere around 3%, give or take, uh, providing you believe them. But for the record, I don't. And and. and from what I see, I live in Toronto and the prices here, it doesn't matter what I look at, everything just keeps going up. I used to shop at Walmart and Costco to save money and I go there and I just spend more money. And even uh, I used to buy a lot of my meats at Whole Foods, you know, and I love beef tenderloin. You know how much I'm paying for a pound of beef tenderloin in Toronto? You're never going to guess. So I'm going to tell you it's $45 a pound. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So I can't even buy it now. I just go to Whole Foods, the window shop. But but what's your take on inflation? I know you just said that there's an issue with wages. But from my perspective, just being the average guy on the street, when I go to the grocery stores or when I go to buy gas or whatever, I see prices just continuing to go up. And I think they're growing up by a lot more than 3% annually. Yes. I mean, there's always been a lot of debate about how accurately CPI or PCE or any of the other common measures of inflation really measure actual felt inflation. And I'd say most of the academic work on this topic reflects exactly the dynamic that you just described. People look at inflation as primarily the cost of food and energy and everything else kind of falls to the wayside. And so people's impressions of inflation are always higher than the actual reported numbers. This goes back decades, literally. So it's a very... It's an important problem because ultimately people anchor their inflation expectations on what they see and what they feel every day and every week when they go to the store or go to the gas pump. And that's the reason inflation does feel a lot higher. And we also have to remember that inflation compounds. So if we go up 10% in one year and 5% the next year and 3% the year after that, which is a rough approximation of what I think we all felt inflation has been like over the last couple of years, you still see higher prices and it just never gets better. And all you have to hope is that ultimately your wages catch up to the inflation that you're feeling. And unfortunately, for a lot of households, it doesn't. Uh, And so there's that persistent feeling that inflation is going to be higher. That's a real problem for the Fed. And I've written about this, and it's an important issue because the Fed's credibility is ultimately tied to how successfully it deals with inflation in this part of the cycle. And right now, they don't get a very good grade, as as you very rightly point out. And all we can hope for is that ultimately things catch up, but the current situation is definitely tough and definitely we all feel it. I mean, my analog in New York is I have a favorite diner that I go to for breakfast some mornings and I had a cup of coffee and an egg sandwich and that used to be $7 and now it's $13.54 every day. Uh, And so I'm fortunate people to pay it, but I do look at that bill every day and say, crap, that's just a lot more money than it used to be. And so you mentioned gas and the price of gas, and this is another. So when we look at CPI, we're looking at shelter, we're looking at food, and we're looking at energy prices, right? Those are the three major components representing about 75% of CPI. And so oil, the price of oil is just ripped from $75 a barrel up to 85, give or take. And who knows, maybe it moves to 100 bucks. And, and of course, the Biden administration is trying to keep the oil prices down as we head into an election. And then you got the Saudis who want a higher oil price. Uh, of course, they want to make more money. But are you concerned about this move that we've seen in the oil price and the impact that it might have on the economy and also CPI? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. I mean, oil prices have been one of the surprise moves of the year. Gold's been the other one. We can discuss gold as well. That's a fascinating story on top of that. You know, the geopolitical situation is not getting any better in the Middle East. We know that. And so gas prices, oil prices are are going to keep climbing, I think. I wouldn't rule out $100 a barrel at all. I think it's a very logical kind of midsummer kind of price because we know there's some seasonality to oil prices. 
The thing that I've focused on in looking at how oil prices affect the economy is that you basically need oil prices to go up 80% in a year to assure a recession. So if you go back to 1990 and the oil shock around the uh, Iraq invasion of Kuwait, <clears throat> or if you go to even 2007, we had the commodity super spike and oil prices went to 140. Every time oil prices go up 80% or more in a year, we get a recession. So the good news is we have some leeway with oil prices before they actually definitely cause a recession uh, in, in Western economies. And we're pretty far away from that. I think we're up 20% year on year, 30% year on year. But if we get to 120, 130 a barrel, that's for sure going to create a recession. And I do worry about that. As far as energy's <clears throat> effect on inflation, you know, I just actually was doing this math a couple of days ago. There's actually not much of a linkage between oil prices and CPI, PCE, core headline, no matter how you want to cut it, in terms of when oil prices spike, does that affect inflation? And the reason is because when oil prices spike, you get a recession. And so you get this kind of countervailing effect. It's not a very welcomed effect, obviously. But if oil prices spike, you don't get a spike in inflation. You actually get a down a downdraft because the economy slows so quickly that prices have to come down. So we don't want that kind of recession. We don't want that kind of outcome. But oil prices don't generally create inflation in most parts of the cycle. What they do is they create a recession that brings inflation down. Again, not what we want, but that dynamic is somewhat offset one against the other. And you mentioned that oil is up 20% on the year, give or take. And, and let's just say if it continues to move up to the $100 level, do you think this is indicative of a, a stronger economy than we are anticipating? And that maybe the threat, there's a threat that we don't cut rates at all this year? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, the short answer is no. I think this move is being driven mostly by geopolitical concerns, entirely fair geopolitical concerns. So worries about oil uh, availability, oil, um, you know, the amount that can be pumped out of the Middle East and get out to the rest of the world. So it feels like it's more geopolitical than it is growth. I'd say U.S. growth is OK. Europe is probably in a kind of zero growth environment. China's only growing very slowly. Uh, Japan's not growing very quickly. So I don't see a demand picture that supports higher oil prices. But I do see traders rightly worried about what happens if we get a hotter war in the Middle East that constrains supply. And, and one thing I always tell clients is never be underweight energy ever because it's the only hedge in a geopolitical shock that drives oil prices higher. It's going to be your only thing that's going up and everything else is going down. I personally own PSCE, which is the U.S. small cap energy ETF, as my hedge. And I own just enough. So if we get an oil spike, the rest of the portfolio gets something of an offset. Okay, so let's move on and discuss the stock market now and how the economy is impacting the market. And um, as we said earlier, the market, uh, this whole move that we've seen in the economy, we're expecting three interest rate cuts, give or take. And uh, the move that we're seeing in the S&P and the NASDAQ, it's all predicated on lower interest rates. And the S&P is already up 10% on the year. NASDAQ's up 10% after a massive year in 2023. But what, what's your take on the stock market here? Do we continue to grind higher or do you see any risk? There's always risks, but I do think we continue to grind higher uh, for a couple of reasons. First, I think companies are getting more realistic about their cost structures. They way over hired over the last couple of years because they had to. Now they're beginning to right size their workforces. That's going to create on the plus side, some better earnings and margin improvement in the back half of the year. On the downside, we're certainly going to have a recession scare at some point I mean, between now and December. You know, it's like clockwork. We always get one every year in the middle part of the cycle. And so that will, on the plus side, probably bring yields down, but on the downside, probably hit stocks. So I think we are still in a constructive part of the market. And, you know, let's look at what leadership has been this year so far. It's not been tech, right? It's been industrials. It's been financials. It's been energy. It's been the kind of things that you want to see rallying in the middle part of a cycle to confirm that there's further growth ahead. So I think that's a positive. On the NASDAQ, what's interesting is the NASDAQ from the rally, the rally off the December 22 lows is actually the worst rally off the lows since 1990, since basically the, the end of the of Gulf War One, And that tells you that as much as the NASDAQ has been working, it's not working the way it typically does coming off of a major bottom, the way we had in December 22. And the reason for that primarily is rates, because in prior instances, you know, two-year rates were either flat or down a lot, 10-year rates were down, and interest rates were giving a push to the NASDAQ, all those high valuation stocks. That's not happening this time. Rates are actually going up. And so it's putting a real cap on the NASDAQ rally. 
So I think there's still room for stocks to go up. I'm not saying we go up in a straight line, but at the same time, we just had a very strong year and strong years tend to indicate you're going to have another reasonable year. And the average of strong years, basically back to 1928, of the type we had last year gives you another 17% move on average the next year. We're up 10 so far. So we can look for another 7% or so between now and the rest of the year. But I take your point, it's not going to be as easy, easy as the first quarter of the year was. We're going to have some chop. I think it comes probably over the summer as oil prices continue to get momentum, as worries about the rate number of rate cuts we get is going to keep growing. So it's not going to be a straight shot, but I do see more room for upside here. No, oh, very interesting. Now, uh, you did say something I want to ask you about, and you said the move from the move on the NASDAQ from its lows in 2022 is the worst that we've seen. What do you mean by that exactly when you say it's the worst that we've seen? So if you go back and look at all the NASDAQ lows, so go back to, I think it was October of 1990 or uh, October of 2002 or the move off the March lows in 2009 or the pandemic, you know, very flat, the flash bear market after the pandemic and the rally after that. And you take the average of all those moves, what you'll find is that we're lagging the average and we're actually lagging the worst of all of those rallies, which was the 02 to 03 rally off the lows for the NASDAQ. And so we're just not getting the same kind of bounce in tech stocks, NASDAQ stocks that we usually do off a major market low. And there's really good reasons for that. The rate picture, as I said, is, is quite cloudy versus much simpler during all those prior rallies. But it also tells you that the NASDAQ's not so overextended relative to what we've seen historically has been the case. The NASDAQ tends to do better than the S&P, which it has, um, but it tends to do better than it has done since the December 22 lows. And what about a name like NVIDIA? We can't talk about the NASDAQ without talking about NVIDIA. <laughs> it's, it's all over the news every day, but it's up, I think it's up 80% on the year, which means it's added like another trillion dollars in market cap. But when you see this, that doesn't concern you at all? Individual stocks going up don't concern me that much. I mean, this, that stock may be way overextended, and then that's fine. Um, but you look at, say, you know, the fact that Apple's down, what, 10% this year? It tells you that markets are being selective. They're not just buying everything. Um, so there are some NASDAQ stocks that are working, others that are not. Some are in the middle, you know, like uh, Google's kind of in the middle. So I'm not seeing a kind of euphoria around the entire space, just one select name, you know. And that's fine. That's the way markets work. You know, as we were talking about the top of, top of, the, of the conversation, one or two stocks tend to drive, you know, a given index. And in this case, it's been NVIDIA. And that's fine. That's the way things usually work. If NVIDIA pulls back in, as it probably should, NASDAQ may take, may take a little bit of a hit, but one stock rallying doesn't worry me that much. And of course, we have to talk about Bitcoin. Um, that's the SEC approved uh, Bitcoin ETFs in January of this year. And as a result, we've seen hundreds of billions of dollars flown into these into these products. Um, once again, you're not concerned about this level of speculation? I actually have covered Bitcoin for a long time. I was actually the first Wall Street analyst to, to put you know pen to paper and write for client, institutional clients about it back in 2012 and 2013. So I've followed the space a long time. And what I think we're seeing is, you know, what was what started as a science project basically has become is becoming an asset class. People believe in this space. And it's not like gold in that gold, you know, half of gold demand is jewelry and, and physical use demand, real demand. And half of gold is for investment, central banks, and other things. Bitcoin only has the speculative investment part of the equation. So it's always going to be more volatile than gold. But there are a class of people, and that class is growing, that view digital assets, digital currencies as a, an aspiring asset class. And that's, I think, whether you think it's valid or not, it's just a fact. That's the way the market's heading. And so do I worry about Bitcoin being a sign of speculation? Not, not especially. Um, speculation to me, I worry when it has big moves and then begins to fall apart. And Bitcoin's done that several times, but it's still around. And so you know, I think it's for some people, they want to consider an asset class and that's fine. I personally think it's interesting. It's not yet an asset class by any means, but there's enough people who think that way. And the ETF uh, approvals kind of show that uh, even the SEC says that's an okay thing to try, that I'm not super worried about Bitcoin's move being indicative of some major market top or excessive um, investor enthusiasm across asset classes. It's kind of particular to those digital currencies. 
So quite often Bitcoin is referred to as digital gold or the new gold. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see any similarities and do you have a preference for one asset over the other? Yeah, I'm always an all of the above kind of guy. I own physical gold. I own gold in financial form and ETFs. I think it's an important part of portfolios. Uh, uh, always has been. I think always will be. It's non-correlated to stocks. It works when other things aren't. So I think it's an important thing for investors to consider owning. And, and as I said, I own it personally in, in every form I can. I also own some Bitcoin because I see it as potentially an emerging asset class. And that's fine. It's a super small position for me. Uh, but it's an interesting asset. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, it's not going to kill me. I think it's an interesting spec trade for the long term. As far as the differences, as I said, gold has actual uses. Gold is used in jewelry. And that's roughly half of all gold demand in any given year. Uh, and so it has a more stable platform of demand that doesn't vary all that much. Maybe up to 3% in a good year, down 4% in a recession, but it's pretty stable. I'm bullish on gold because I think central banks around the world are buying more gold and will be buying gold for a long time to come. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation and the sanctions against Russia, I think, prove to a lot of countries, a lot of central bankers, that you can't just own treasuries as, you're, uh, as, in, as in, in your central bank reserves. You have to own something else that's dollar denominated but can't be confiscated or sanctioned. And the list of those options are pretty short, and it's gold. And so you're seeing central banks, China, Russia, Central Asian republics, uh, some Eastern European republics, Turkey, all buy gold for their reserves as basically a way to buy dollar exposure without having to buy treasuries or financial assets that can be sanctioned or confiscated or the kind of things that happened with Russia uh, back 18 months ago. So I think that's a persistent trend. It's going to grow for a long time. And so I'm bullish on gold for that single reason. I see a lot of inc incremental demand coming from central banks. That's not going to go away. As a matter of fact, We've seen central banks pull back on purchases over the past couple of months, as I think, I think a lot of gold, uh, gold analysts know. And I think the reason for the spike in gold recently has been traders are front running what they know is going to be a lot of demand for central banks coming the back half of the year. So I'm bullish on gold as well. Oh, very good points. Now, uh, you brought up the central banks and they did buy. They were very aggressive buyers in the last two years. I believe they bought about 25 percent of total production in 2023, a like amount in 2022. I guess my question to you is, do you see any risk to the downside? Let's just say they stop buying. I Yes, that is a risk, but I don't see a situation where they stop buying because, you know, for better or worse, the U.S. weaponized the dollar a little bit over the last two years with the whole situation with Russia. And I think central banks have very long memories and uh, government leaders have very long memories, and so they see gold as one way to get around <clears throat> having to buy treasuries and having to buy dollar-based assets as part of their reserve structures. And gold answers that need. And it's, you know, people who don't like gold tend to say, oh, it has no value, it has no cash flows. It has a 5,000-year proven track record of holding value. That's not going to change. Uh, and so central banks will keep buying gold. Yes, it's a risk if they stop, but I don't see a situation where they rationally stop. I think if anything, geopolitical tensions are rising and the weaponization of the dollar makes gold an even more relevant asset to rest of world central banks. So central banks have been very aggressive buyers, but we really haven't seen the retail market get involved yet. And when I say that, I'm looking at ETFs. And in fact, in 2023, there was outflows. Do you think... What are your thoughts on that? And when do you see the retail investor getting involved? And do you think Bitcoin is is kind of taking away a lot of that interest in gold? Yeah, those are both very good points. I mean, you're right. Uh, ETF flows and the commodity fund flows have been pretty bad the last year. They turned positive for a couple of weeks um, about a month ago, but they've been pretty slow uh, ever since. And they were slow last week as well. We do a month. We do a weekly update for our clients on that topic. And so you're right. You know, the, the thing that drives retail investor interest in anything is if it's going up. You know, that's that's the way the retail flows tend to work. So if gold continues to rise, I think you're going to see ETF interest begin to improve. I don't think Bitcoin ETFs are taking a lot of share away from gold or Bitcoin and you know virtual currency wallets are taking a lot of interest away. I think it's two different kinds of buyer based on demographics. I think younger people look at Bitcoin as potentially what gold could be. But I think the, the, you know, the majority of people with large asset bases, wealthier people, they tend to be older and they'll skew towards buying gold. So I think if we do have another run in gold, 
I don't really rely on retail flows for driving that. I think it's institutional flow, central bank flows that will really drive the big move. Um, but if, if retail comes along, that, that would obviously be helpful. So let's summarize everything you just said. First of all, on the economy, you're still very, you think we're in a mid cycle. The economy is going to grind higher. It's going to climb this wall of worry. You're still bullish on the S&P. It, it was up, uh, it's already up 10% on the year. You think that could, I believe you said another 7%. Was that right? That's right. And that's just based on a very strong 2023. You think it's going to continue. You're very bullish on gold. And uh, for the reasons that you just stated, um, what, anything else? Am I missing anything? No, that's that pretty much covers the waterfront. The other thing I'd say is uh, we are perennially bearish on non-U.S. stocks relative to U.S. stocks. Um, our perspective is that you know, the historical record is pretty clear. The S&P has compounded at 12 percent over the last decade. Uh, IFA, which is Europe and, and, and Japan, has only compounded at seven. Emerging markets have only compounded at three. People view that as an anomaly. We do not. We think that's structural. The U.S. form of capitalism is just better at creating shareholder value than Europe or China or emerging markets. We create the kind of companies that generate a lot of earnings power, um, and that's what drives stock prices. Economic growth doesn't drive stock prices. Corporate earnings do. And so as much as EM and IFA stocks are cheap, and they certainly are, we think that you have to go with the earnings growth and you have to go with the structural economies that create value for shareholders. And, and that's really in the U.S. and North America. It doesn't exist as much in Europe and it barely exists in emerging markets. They're good at economic growth, but they're not making the kind of companies that investors want to buy over the long term. So the last thing I'd say is you want to be still looking at U.S. stocks and don't think that because EFA stocks or EM stocks are cheaper by on a P-E ratio, that they all of a sudden have a big catch up move coming. That's just not the way markets work. All very good points. So before I let you go, Nick, I want to ask you one more question about Stevie Cohen. Uh, he was a very successful trader, as we all know, but he has not been a very successful baseball owner. The New York Mets have had a disastrous few years. What are your thoughts on that? Yes. <clears throat> Look, I think Steve, even though he's a trader, he does understand the long term. That was one of the fascinating things talking to him as an analyst. And I came to him as an analyst after 10 years working at Credit Suisse for a spot to cover the auto industry. And he understood the long-term story behind companies, behind sectors, and he understood why things work the way they do over multi-year timeframes. So I'd say he's probably not all that surprised. It's been a tough slog so far. I'm sure he's disappointed, but I think he understands that any kind of big picture mission takes years and years and years. So <clears throat> I'm not a big sports fan. I don't really follow anything, but I do understand his management style. And I don't think he's going to give up and, and, and try to sell the team, but I think he hopefully understands that this is more like turning around an industry or a company than it is just trading stocks. Fascinating comments, Nick. As we wrap up, if anyone would like to learn more about you or follow you on social media, where can they go? Sure. Uh, our website's datatrekresearch.com. You can sign up for a two-week free trial to our newsletter, and you'll see the, in written form the kind of things we've been talking about here today. We're also on Twitter at DataTrekMB and on uh, YouTube uh, as well. We've got a bunch of videos, particularly the, the gold video I did a few months ago, I think is proving quite correct. So you can go on YouTube and check us out at DataTrek and Nick Collis and Jessica Rabe. Um, and I really appreciate the time today. It's been a great conversation. Yes, I've enjoyed it very much. YouTube is the new CNBC, isn't it? It absolutely is. It's a super productive way to get you know high quality information like your channel, like our channel, and you get to hear it in very long form and great discussions rather than three minute sound bites. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, listen, thank you very much for making time with us today. And I look forward to our next discussion. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nick Coles and it provided you with some insights on what to expect in the economy and also the markets in the coming months. One of the things that resonated with me was how bullish Nick was on the price of gold and where he thinks it's going in the coming months and how he uses it to fortify his portfolio. Gold has been in a long slumber for many years, but it looks like it's starting to wake up and make a move. And if you would like to learn more about gold and how to buy it, please check out our website, wealthion.com forward slash how to buy. And you can learn the many benefits of owning gold and also how to purchase it and how to store it. If you also have any suggestions on who else you would like to see on our channel, please let us know in the comments section below. We would love to hear your thoughts. Once again, I want to thank you for spending time with us today, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.